And here we are, another Saturday under the belt. Let me get everything going here correctly. So, uh, yeah, so this is uh, episode, or, or I guess uh, we won't call it episode, we'll call it Power Hour Number 172, like a one, Cessna 172 today. So we've done 172 of them. That's a lot. It's a lot, lot, lot. Anyway, so happy Saturday to you, uh, those of you who are here. Let me just take a look quickly, see if uh, anybody, so there's about 60 of you now. <clears throat> it's about right. That's what we guess. Oh, yeah, you're all coming in there now. Uh, let's see what I can get going here. Uh, so we got a bunch of people here. We're going to do a roundtable. And the idea here is going to be to uh, to share experience of people who really have been in the business for a long time and uh, give any tips they want to say or the ten some things they learned as a flight instructor that might pass on to you. This is also good for people who aren't flight instructors because it really says what you should be looking for, like in, an ex in a CFI. Well, what I found is that I've heard, like, I hear ground lessons and when we do our CFI class here in Miami. There's a 141 school that we work within. And uh, all the CFIs are pretty young. Uh, there's some senior people, but generally they're pretty young. And uh, they will do end up doing like three hours of ground with no breaks, right? And and, and, they, and then they'll have uh, everything written on a board before the student shows up. And the student's just reading the board, right? Not paying any attention to what's going on uh, in, the, in the class or what the instructor's saying. And then it's this... There's a lot of things there. So, but when you had done this for a long time, you kind of get good at it. <laughs> and then you you go through and you go, like, oh, that doesn't work very well. Or you hear other things, you go like, well, that's wrong. <laughs> and you go, I don't think I'd do that. So that's kind of like the idea of it. So uh, let me tell you who we have. So we got Dorothy. She's here, Dorothy Schick. She runs the Facebook study group. She's an instructor based in Oregon. And I know her through a person who used to work for us, Jonathan. And so she runs that Facebook study group, which you should join. There's a link and you're going to get later later for it. It's been growing pretty good. So she's been doing this a long time. She knows what's up. And I got Rex Scholl here. He's uh, from Ogden, Utah. And he's both a glider and an airplane CFI. I didn't know that until he updated his thing, which is good. And he does a lot of work with the AAA and uh, the Salt Lake City FISDO uh, FAST team. So that's pretty good. So now he's working on CFII. But he's also co-runs the... Uh, Facebook study group with uh, with Dorothy there. And I got Greg. Greg's been around for a while. He's an Arizona-based CFI, and he's uh, he wrote the Savvy Flight Instructor and the Turbine Pilots, Pilots uh, fly, Flight Manual and some other things. So uh, he's got really solid methods. I like him. Well, I like them all, but anyway, just so you know. <laughs> and uh, I don't see Colton here, but if he is here, uh, we'll bring him in. And then there's me. So I'm Florida-based, and both San Francisco-based and there, but... So um, I think some people didn't realize that I had UK pilot certificates as well as American ones. And I was an examiner there as well as here. So I don't usually say that a lot, but sometimes, so you get that way, you know, we're going to have another fellow on uh, Edward Bailey, who was one of our students who also is a flight instructor, Yasa flight instructor and uh, American one. And uh, his dad flies the Dreamliner for British Airways. Uh, uh, so anyway, he, I, we meet occasionally in San Jose where that used to fly. I don't know if it flies in there anymore, but Edward is really going to talk about the differences VFR. So, uh, and those differences can be quite, uh, quite big. So, um, so that, that's kind of idea what we're doing. Now, these guys are unmuted. Of course, you're not. So, haha. -ha. <laughs> but at the end of the, at the end, we'll make you so you can, you can chime in. If you have something to say, the best way to do it is through chat, right? If you, if you have a comment and we save all the chats and you get a copy of the chat so that if something is interesting in there and, or you need to put a link of something that you think, you know, whatever, that's fine. So, uh, and I, I missed, I got David St. George here too. Ha ha. So David is the executive director of SAFE and he's been flying a long time. He also flies charter to DPE and uh, he does a lot of a uh, lot of work for SAFE. I, we run into each other often and, and we share a lot of ideas about things. He's uh, So anyway, he's, he runs that. And SAFE, if you don't know, is Society of Aviation and Flight Educators. It's uh, safepilots.org. And uh, two things on that. The first is if you join that, they represent our kind of people, right? And uh, there's about 6,000 approximately members. And uh, another reason to do it is you get a third off your fourth flight subscription. So I pay, say, 45 bucks, 50 bucks, and I get like $100, $110 off my <clears throat> fourth flight subscription. So that's already reason for, for me to do it. But I, I like the organization. It did really good work. All right. So without further ado, uh, I'll just start by saying one of the things I wanted to, to bring out that I learned, one of the biggest things I learned, and uh, I still haven't cracked this nut yet. But uh, but I, I'm, I don't think I ever will, but it's something I notice, And that's that uh, I've never had two students alike. They're all vastly different. 
And they come from different goals, values. What can be important to one is completely not important to the other one. They have different reasons for wanting to learn how to fly. They're, they come from different education backgrounds and they learn differently. And that's my issue sometimes is that I look at that and I go like, okay, I think I understand who you are. I think I can communicate to you. But uh, then, you know, you say you have a class of maybe 10 and you you know them as individuals after a while. And then you you will say the same things in the classroom to these 10 people. And at the end of the class, some of them will swear they never heard it or heard it in a different way, or they process it all different. And so this was my, my biggest challenge as a teacher was trying to make sure that the students are understanding what I'm saying as opposed to what I think they got. So assessment becomes like a huge thing for me. And then uh, I've never been totally successful trying to get into somebody's head and say, uh, you're a, a visual learner, so therefore I should do this. I think people go back and forth between those. They could be, could be auditory one day, depending on what the situation is. So, and I struggle with that. I think everybody struggles with that. But the, so my biggest takeaway is I'm still trying to figure that out, but I'm getting better at it. So at least I'm, I'm learning how to assess a little bit better and to make sure that I have a class of 10 to make sure that each individual is getting out of it what I think they should be getting out of, as opposed to, okay, I set it, therefore it's good. So that that's one of the one of the things. So I just adding a lot more assessment. And we're doing that through uh, a quizzing questions with just oral quizzing sometimes or sometimes just uh, some some sort of written exam. I find the FA exam not useful for that. In fact, when people ask me how to study for the FA test, I'll tell you what you should do. Uh, so uh, this is what I think. So I think you should not prepare for the test at all. I mean, in terms of of test prep. I think you should, before you before you go see your flight instructor, you're take, you know, I think you should take the test and then that score without you preparing for it, without you knowing the questions and answers, should be then a reflection of what you know. If, if you prepare for it and you get a 95%, it doesn't really help me. It doesn't help me at all. So, but if you don't prepare for it and you take and you take a sample, you know, the, not the real one, but you take a sample one and you give it to me, I think we'll know where you stand. Then go prepare all you want to to get a high score, that's fine to do. But uh, that's that's my thing would be to give your unprepared uh, knowledge test score and what you missed on a, on a sample test to your flight instructor and and then uh, use that as a basis for them to help you with things. Okay, so let's uh, start off with maybe Dorothy. Dorothy probably has something to say. What's up, Dorothy? Hey, hi, Michael. Hey, Hello. everybody. Nice, thank you for having us on today. This is always a, a pleasure to be able to join you. Uh, just a, a quick note on our CFI study group. You know, it, it started out, and this is a Facebook group that started out maybe three and a half years ago, primarily uh, to uh, help tutor commercial pilots studying for their CFI. And it's, I think, more now become a learning platform for all levels. So just to, to let everybody know about that a little bit. You know, on, on something you just said about the assessment, if, if I could go back to the beginning of my CFI career, I would say the art of the open-ended question, uh, meaning the difference between an open-ended and a, and a closed is that a closed would be something like, what is the rotation speed of your 172? Um, whereas an open-ended might be, well, tell me how you would know, tell me a little bit about carburetor icing and how you might determine you had carb ice. So they have to respond. And what really I found out is it's really during the debrief of any debrief that I had, if I could start in with saying, okay, let's, we've just had our lesson. Uh, what, let's do three things that you would like to tell me about I'm talking to my learner, my student, tell me three, you know, top tier things that you learned today and just leave it open. And oftentimes what I would find is they would start in with the bad things like oh, uh, horrible landings today. I'm like, okay, why do you think that is, right? So we start finding out what the thought process is and what, and that, actually my determination was they had pretty darn good landings, right? But it wasn't what I wanted to know. I wanted to know what they thought because from there, I can determine where they're coming from individually and I can drill down a little bit more into their thought process and know what they're what they think about and what they learned and of course once you've done some of that then you can get back and provide them with feedback on what they thought so if, if I were to say that one top thing that I really wish I had had a better feel for in my beginning was that 
open-ended question and the ability, like you said, Mike, to to assess people better early on uh, yeah. in their training, early on in my training too as a CFI, uh, and how to how to how to mold those assessments to help them learn better and more. Yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, I'll go through this uh, the the team here with just in order. I have it on the outline, so in case. That's uh, so all go with Rex next. So that was good. I, it kind of supported what I had to say, which is always good. <laughs> all right, go ahead, Rex. Very good. Well, um, also, thanks for having me here. Dorothy yeah. and I <clears throat> worked together on the CFI study group, holding that weekly meeting or whatever. But um, I don't know, since we're we're kind of on this topic, I like to um, teach somebody something. So for instance, I had a, a couple of uh, friends that are working together. Um, they've decided to, you know, one back seat and one front seat. And kind of watch each other. Um, there's some, uh, I think some high value in a uh, back seating um, that we're not, you know, maybe completely paying attention to either. Cause you know, when you have, when you're flying for a student pilot, I mean, I, I think you have probably 70 to 98% of the brain power of your um, focus, focus on the flying test, the basic flying task. And so being able to learn and, and take in information Obviously, the airplane is a, a horrible classroom, right? So um, being able to take in that information, sometimes sitting in the back seat and watching the other person do it or watching them, you know, do it well or mess up or things like that, you have much more of your the focus, um, your focus available to assess what's going on. So um, another thing uh, kind of relating to what uh, Dorothy said is uh, in, with the same group, I talked to them about uh, VX and VY. And they could like kind of rattle it back to me, right? So um, VX, uh, best angle, you know, excess thrust and stuff like that. But then I um, moved it to an application. And I said, well, when would we use it? And I, I found that uh, my explanation wasn't enough so that they could um, actually apply it. And so when we started talking about it, I said, well, when would we want to use the optimize for distance and use the shortest distance? They're like, Oh, how about a short runway? And I'm like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. So asking some questions where you start to, you know, use that RUAC model, you know, rote understanding application correlation and kind of see if they can, you know, how far they can take it down the, the path. So I think intelligent questions um, is also very important. Yeah, these are things you learn based on experience, you know, the better you get better. Hey, hey Rex. Yeah, well, one thing I love that I used to say, okay, we study short, you know, short and soft field VX, right? And then I'm like, well, so what exactly is a short field, right? And they like, eyes like, I don't know. I mean, well, is the 172, can it take off of a thousand foot runway? Well, can a jet land on our runway 3,100 feet, right? So trying to get them to process, well, it depends on the aircraft, right? My champ can get off in a, you know, couple hundred feet, but what about you? So those kind of questions where you're, like you said, applying, finding out the correlation application, that's key. Yes. All right, Greg, what do you have to say? Hold on, Greg. We can't hear you. Yeah, not yet. Let's see audio. Let me make sure I have him unmuted here. Here. Let's try that. Give it a try. No, we don't hear you now. We had we did a sound check before. We don't hear you. Okay, how about now? Oh, now we hear you. Okay, you're on. I will right. teach me to use an external mic, and I'm yeah. confused here. Um, the the single biggest focus I've developed over the years is on empowerment. In other words, that the student. As much as possible, I want them to be the PIC. Now, that's going to change over the course of the, the lessons, right? But going along with what Dorothy said, they're asking open-ended questions, encouraging discussions, involving the students in every decision you possibly can. You know, what do you think of the weather today? Uh, does the engine sound right to you? Are you comfortable that all the systems are working? Because you want them to be in command to be able to handle emergencies and so on, but they'll progress faster. Um, 
just a small example that, that I actually really like to use, you know, sometimes you'll have a student uh, usually early on and they'll notice a crack in the a piece of fiberglass, uh, the tip of, you know, out on the wing tip and it's been drilled and everything, but the student's uncomfortable about it. So not only will I tell, will I tell them my answer, you know, that's not a structural part and the stop drilling addresses it. But if I sense they're still nervous, I'll say, why don't you go run over to the shop and grab the mechanic? and have him or her come out and answer your question. Because we want them, if they're nervous about something, to take action. And a related part of this is to make every lesson as much fun, as rewarding as it can possibly be. Because if we're passionate about something, whether it's a game or flying or right? Anything we're really into, if we have a lot of fun with it, we're going to do a lot of it. We're going to make extra effort to learn. We're going to be motivated. And so that's uh, an important part. Two other aspects of this empowerment. I love to challenge the student to find me in errors. Greg, if, or uh, uh, Joanne, if you see that I've made, you think I've made a mistake, I'm wrong about something, Tell me, let's look it up, because I might be wrong, or otherwise, you see, it's going to lead to a discussion, isn't it? I'm probably right some of the time, but I actually, on occasion with some students, I've told them, hey, I'll buy you lunch if you catch me in some in an error. Well, that makes a game out of it, right? But it's it, it emphasizes the empowerment of the pilot in command part of it. And then the last part of this I'll mention, uh, which I'm sure others are going to mention too, but touch the controls as little as possible while maintaining safety of flight. And some of you have heard my story about this before, but when I was a primary student, uh, like so many others, I put the airplane into a spin, a 150 up in Wisconsin, and my instructor, Bob Vetter, sat there with his arms crossed, and we were, you know, in a fully developed spin at a safe altitude. And Bob says, well, Greg, what are you going to do about this? And I go, I don't know. And he talked me through it, but he never touched the controls. What a great lesson, both in terms of spin recovery, because I've always remembered that ever since, of course, but also in terms of instructing when you can safely let them make an error or test the limits of a maneuver, let them do it because then they develop the confidence they can handle it as opposed to my instructor grab the controls. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a thing I say that, that, you know, don't don't let them as students make mistakes, right? They, they learn by making mistakes and, and you have to, you only interject when it's unsafe, clearly unsafe, or they're obviously really frustrated. If they're frustrated, then you take control and reteach, but you don't really touch it unless, unless you need to. What do you think, David? I, I I think Greg Brown is a master instructor. Yeah. I can tell that <laughs> right off the bat because I you know what he said there is exactly what I um, I repeat over and over. I call it incremental mastery, which is as soon as somebody has full control of something and they understand it, I turn it over to them. It's theirs. I don't touch that again. I may you know, nuance it a little, but that's your part. And, you know, our job as flight instructors is actually to get out of the plane, you know, and the big mistake that new CFIs make, and this is because you were passing an FAA practical and an FAA practical is not a realistic training scenario. The app, the person who's, you know, taking the test is micromanaging the controls, talking on the radio. And, you know, if they go into the real world of teaching that way, where they're micromanaging the controls and the radio, the learner doesn't gain anything. So, you know, they have to learn initially to get off the controls and the radio, but they're scared to death, you know, because they're so used to planes going straight and everything going right. And I don't know if anyone else here remembers your first couple lessons where you get in as a CFI and, you know, the plane's going all over the place. <laughs> it's shocking, but you have to create that safe space for that learner to experiment and self-correct. And that's exactly what Greg's saying, you know, is, is let them experiment, you know, fix their own problems. I don't think I've ever had anyone go into a spin and just sat there. That, that would be a real test, but um, 
but I think it's really important, especially at the level that you guys, um, you know, transitioning into CFI and new CFIs to realize is that what you learned in the practical um, and what Mike teaches you, you pass that test, you've become safe in the right seat. And that's what the FAA has certificated you for when I do a CFI, you know, initial. Um, but you haven't really become a good educator. And that's where the mentoring comes in. Uh, mentoring is just essential to make that next next step because you don't know what you don't know. And my mentor, John Stickle, you know, was we call him the great Sphinx because he really was, he'd fold his arms and listen. But his favorite phrase to me was, if the student hasn't learned, you haven't taught. So it put the, you know, the responsibility on the CFI. I hear so many young CFIs in flight school saying, Oh, my student this, my student that. It's not their fault. It's your fault. You didn't teach them. You didn't convey. Like you said in the first part there, Mike, you know, communication is very hard. You said the words, you wrote it on the board, but you didn't get it into, you didn't make an impression. You didn't, uh, learning occurs with a change in behavior. If you didn't make that change in behavior, you failed. You're not an educator. You said the words, blah, blah, blah. I read the iPad. I, and I just, you know, when I go, I, you know, go to a lot of these academies to do flight tests and I see the young instructors frustrating, denigrating their students. And I'm like, you know, it's totally wrong. It's your fault. And, you know, the big problem I see in aviation right now is there aren't enough mentors. There aren't enough senior oversight. So just remember to go into it humble and say, <clears throat> well, it might be me <laughs> that's failed here, not my students. So that's yeah. what I got for you. Well, that's good. So the the other part I would say is I think that uh, you uh, safe put up a mentoring uh, uh, Facebook group, right? I think you have that. Right. So I think people yes. can join that, and I think they just join. They just show up to it, and if they have questions or and and sort of we see a lot of that in that Facebook uh, the CFI study group. I see a lot of people who come in and want critiqued on various there. I have questions and there's a lot of good, good people in both of the, all those. In fact, you cross pollinate right. runs both of them, I think. I'm yes, not... Dorothy runs yeah. them both. You know, the thing is though, um, the I think it's like when we do those FAA wings programs and who comes to the FAA wings programs, the safe people. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and who comes to the mentoring programs is the humble people that want mentoring, you know, and then all the, you know, sort of uh, arrogant ones don't show up, you know, and they're the ones that need a little kind of dope slap to say, hey, wake up here. Dave, so, can I, I have a question yeah. for you. Are you finding that with a lot of young people, they aren't accustomed to the concept of mentoring? I mean, it seems to me that uh, like I, we all had mentors in, in, you know, our era, if, if you can call it that, but it seems like young people don't, they don't look for those opportunities or I, I just wondered if it's only my perception or if you've run into that. No, I think you're right, Greg. I think if I ask and they don't know, they immediately, you know, going to Google it. <laughs> Is it on Wikipedia? Can I get it off my phone? But they don't tend to ask and solicit and, yeah, to develop a relationship where, but boy, I can tell you that is for me, that was the whole, the whole story was transitioning from that new CFI with the wet temporary to somebody who could really do an effective job. You know, and that's the real question is, can you take somebody from a, a person on the street and make them into a pilot in 40, 50 hours? That is a huge transition. Um, you've got to be good at it. Um uh, but mentoring, yeah, I think is underappreciated and it's available now. I mean, Dorothy's got that group online. It's uh, both of those groups. Excellent. The study group and the other one. Yeah, those are those are good things. And you, these things are all like I make a case and I, I tell CFIs or people like when I was uh, a CFI actively working for private pilot or whatever, my rates were always higher than anybody else's. I made it that way. And like by a lot, like by $30, $40 an hour, I said, but I said, let me show you something. I put down a spreadsheet and I say, I'm going to be able to finish you in about this much time. This person, this brand new person over here is $30 less an hour than me. They're going to finish you in this amount of time. And then let's look at the difference of what you're really going to pay. 
I'll finish you in 55 hours. That person will finish you in 70 hours. Now, what you're going to pay, okay, you're winning is you're getting the lower rate. But when you start losing is when you is when you go past the 55 hours and you're paying for the instructor and the airplane. And then you find out that that whittles right into that rate like crazy. So experience is one of those things that you can you can get really good flight instruction if you seek it out. Really good flight instruction. So, you know, the, the idea is not when people are rate shopping, you kind of have, sometimes have to educate them and saying, like our CFI course is not not cheap, right? Our instructors are 120, 130, sometimes 150 an hour. But that's a niche thing. It's a boutique thing. You're only going to pay that for 15 hours or 20 in the airplane. It's not going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. So the the rate doesn't really influence as much as you think. It's the airplane that that does most of it. So there's there's that. And so I, I think people need to be sometimes shown the value of something. And it's hard well, Mike, to buy that, right? A, a, a comparison I use for that's. I'm with you 100% on that argument. And uh, something I found for uh, in discussing this with someone who's considering lessons is to think about a good mechanic. You take your car or your airplane in, you can go to the person who can't find the problem for yeah. 40 hours, and they're only 10 bucks an hour, right? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> or you can go to the person who's the pro who charges 50 bucks an hour and figures it out in 30 minutes. Yeah, that's a big difference. And that's that's the advantage. Now, it's hard to, like I told people, I said, you can buy as much training as you want, but you cannot buy experience. You know, that that's that comes to you as, as a, you know, as over years, over time. Right. But you can you can buy that. OK, I need to take a break just for a second. So then we can go back into our, our thing. Let me see who's in the room. So we have uh, 65 of you. OK, that's good. So I'll, if I miss you, don't yell at me. <laughs> But okay, Alex and Tammy are here. Andrew Kasun, I'll get back with you on email today. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for Scooby Doo. Uh, Brian Huang is here. Bruce Ray. Hello, Bruce. He's from Colorado. Then uh, we've got who else is here that I know? Clifford, the CL, capital C, capital L. Then Ifford is here. I got Deb's. I think that Deb is uh, Deb Gangwish, my guess is. The corn lady from Nebraska uh, is here. I got the corn lady. Uh, Frank Webster's here. Glenn Johnson. Hi, Glenn. He talked yesterday. Uh, we talked last week. Herb is here. He's a CFI from Palo Alto. And I've got Jim Holiday. Lee Perrin, anesthesiologist, is here. And he's also part of... I know he's in the Facebook study group. You know you know him. He's in there. I got... Uh, who else is in here? Olive, Oliver. Oliver is from the Bay Area, Santa Cruz area. Uh, Raul is here. So Raul is an interesting character. He does a uh, character, I should say. You probably know him. He has a he does a sport pilot stuff. He knows a lot of, about sport pilots, and he's a uh, I run into him at various trade shows. I forgot exactly. I'll put it in chat where his school is, but he has wants to do a presentation on. <clears throat> I don't know if you know this, but sport pilot. In order you in, if you initially get a rating and you want another one, you don't need to involve a DPE or you don't need to involve uh, the FAA. It's just two flight instructors. One does the training, the other gives the profic proficiency check. So he has a presentation on the proficiency proficiency check because he said we're people really aren't doing a very good job with that. So we want to have him on to do specifically that. I think that's going to be as as we get mosaic and we get the higher weights on these sport pilot uh, the, the and we'll fly heavier airplanes. It's going to make a big bigger difference. So I'm ha happy about that. Who else is here? Uh, I got uh, Robin Lindstrom is here. He never said last name, but I know you. I have Robin L. Stephanie, she's at, her and her husband own a Technum twin. They're based in Frederick at the home of AOPA. I run into her at trade shows all the time and, and him. Uh, Soledad is here from the Dominican Republic. Tom Mosley is here. Walt's here. I have Walt and Wendell, of course. Who, who wouldn't? Wendell's there. Okay, so that's who we've got in here. Oh, yeah, there's Deb, Deb's from Nebraska. That, that's Deb. She put it in the chat. The corn. How's the corn, Deb? Is it okay? The corn's starting to grow. <laughs> it's frozen. She does something. I forgot. She, But she's likely to join us at one of her CFI classes. Okay, so that's what we got going on. Let me uh, tell you about something. So I've been working on my secret project. So, um, so we need about five beta testers. Now, don't all jump in and but if you if you're serious about this, then I'm I'll I'll take you on. We need about five people. Uh, so what I, this is what it is. So I, I made a, this new study system. It's called CFI Smart Study Pro, and it's a system to study for your CFI. So if you're not going to come to one of our classes, or you are, and you feel like I just want to study more, I want to get ready, I want to do this. This is this is for you. So this takes every one of the technical subject areas, all 26 uh, areas that are ground in the CFI. 
And what I did is I made a, a 10, between a 10 and a 30 minute audio presentation. It's all audio, no video. And so that you can listen to like on your, it's a summary of that complete area of operation. And then once you're done with that, uh, then there's a companion PDF for every lesson that has images, summaries, that kind of thing that'd be useful. Uh, you could, if you were in a place where you could watch them both simultaneously, that might be good, but you don't have to. That's main, mainly built for audio. So then you have the companion PDFs. And then after that, the last thing is there's uh, our CFI PTS laser focus guide, we call it, which takes every element in the PTS for all the ground topics. And it says where the resources are for it, any crib notes, like what you should know about it, and what the chapters, page numbers, FAR, whatever that is. So it concentrates your studies. So you're not I mean, it's, it's great to be able to go out in the handbook and, you know, get everything yourself. But sometimes when you want to study something, it's nice just to know I have all the resources. I have these are the ACs I need. This is what I need. This is what I need. That, that's what I need. So I think that rings the bell for how do I study for the CFI thing. And so uh, we're going to release it at some point. It's six hours, by the way. So the only issue, if you're going to be one of our beta tests, you've got to listen to those six hours. You can't just do. And then quickly, not not like in a month. Oh, I'll get around that. So if you want to do it, then do it. But and I'm happy to give you the finished product when it's done. I don't know how much it's going to be. We haven't decided that yet. Somewhere around 200 bucks, my guess is something around there. But it's a lot of work. So, but anyway, we need beta testers and whatever. So I'm sure there'll be errors. I'm sure. So that's that's one thing. And then our Las Vegas class is filling up. So if you're thinking about coming, uh, well, our March class basically has one seat left in it. And then, but if you're thinking about coming to Las Vegas, especially if you're going to use VA benefits, if you're going to do that, time is now because uh, Liberty University might be getting back their VA stuff really soon. If that happens, then all those VA people uh, or, or our Air Force people are currently Liberty and going in Las Vegas will come into those classes and they'll fill up. And we can only hold 10. We can't, we can hold remotely. And I also tell you that we use the OWL for technology. So uh, if you haven't seen our camera technology, it's amazing. So basically this window that you see, the first like 25% of it will be a 360 degree view all the way around the classroom. And then the owl will split views between whoever's talking. It knows who's talking, will look at you. And then it will, uh, and if someone else talks, it'll put another window up with that person talking or three people talking. So it's a really good interpersonal experience, but better than just a single static cam. So anyway, we have the owl in Las Vegas. We use it everywhere. That's kind of really cool. We like that thing. So anyway, if you're looking at how we're different, there you go. All right, now let's go back to uh, our banter here. And then I'll, uh, also the power hours, I forgot. If you want to see them, you you can't, we don't publish them. So they're only available on our membership site. If you look in the recap, you're going to get of all this. You'll get a way to get in for, for, for pretty cheap, about nine bucks, right? It was uh, 172 of these, 172nd one is today. So anyway, all ton, tons of topics, marketing to deep the mathematics in the eights on pylons I did uh, to show you why it's divided by 11.3 and what pivotal altitude really is. Those kind of things are all in there. So anyway, let's uh, move on. So I wanted to mention just before we... Uh, that the David runs a SAFE, which is Site of Aviation Flight Educators. Join that. Uh, if you're a flight instructor, you, you will benefit, only benefit from that. All right. You will, nothing, nothing bad will happen to you if you join, I promise you. Uh, so Wendell say he wants to be a beta tester. Uh, so uh, are, are, you, are you selling anything, Greg? Well, oh, I can't this, I know it. Good. Huh? for this audience, uh, my book, The Savvy Flight Instructor, is yeah. probably what you're interested in. And they can get that from ASA, is that right? Well, they can. The only thing is, and there's a link, uh, I think Nick put it in there. Uh, yes, thank you, Nick, for that. Uh, the, the book is no longer in print. ASA has cut back on print books, but it's readily available in ebook. So okay. you get it from ASA, Amazon, Red, whatever the red thing is, uh, Apple, Kindle, all of it. <laughs> All of them. But uh, caution on it. Be sure you get the second edition that has the clouds on the cover because there are some print copies of the first edition, which is quite old. And the second edition is much more contemporary. On, and I'll just say this much more about it. The book is is about... The day you become a CFI and you have all those questions as a new one, that's who the book is really for. It It's how to set rates, how to keep your students motivated, what to do with certain kinds of problems, students. Um, if you have a flight school, there are a lot of tips there on how to run it. And um, I think you'll get a lot out of it. 
All right. I think I think every new flight instructor should get that. That's just what I was saying about now you pass the test. Yeah. And there's all this stuff that no one told you how to market yourself, set prices. And just like Mike and Greg were saying, you know, do you want to be the cheapest person there? You know, you want to be the quality person. So and that Deb, book is essential. Yeah. Deb Gangwish says in Thanks, chat, Dave. she just got the second edition digital book. She goes, have a day of traveling on Monday. Looking forward to reading it on the plane. There you go. That's good. That makes my day. Thank yeah, you. That, so now, now you're... She, you know, that's the corn lady. <laughs> that's fun. Okay, well, let's let's pick another topic. We sort of went around the horn there. So, uh, Mike, yes, can, I, can I just go back to one thing we were talking about, the sure. experience level of, of new instructors. And one thing, and then this goes back to the ancient days when I learned, we had to do 100 mile, 300, our, our long cross country was 300 miles. Correct. For private pilot. And obviously that's been shortened now. Uh, I'm seeing now a lot of instructors who want to go that they want their that cross country for their student to be more than 50, like 50.5. Can we get by with that? Which is literally next door in a, as far as an airplane goes, right? Most of us could go know the whole area uh, that we've driven in in our hometown or wherever we happen to be. My, I've seen this that new pilots are afraid to go much further once they get their private because gosh, what could be out there? And and in my opinion, it we as instructors need to go that distance. We need to take them a hundred. We need to take them, yeah, it's gonna cost a little bit more, but if they don't have that experience and they keep going up through the ranks, what, you know, what, oh, a 250 mile, that's nothing as a commercial pilot, right? Um, so, and, and for those who don't keep going up to give them that feeling, that understanding that they can, they can use the airplane, uh, they can go farther. I mean, gosh, I got my, you know, private pilot and I kind of stupidly maybe, but I flew from Oregon to Salt Lake city, like right off the bat, you know, like, like I have no idea where I was at VOR, right? It's like, what I'm going, man. So, uh, I, I think you know, that amount of, of knowledge you gain from being on your own, having gone at some longer cross countries with your instructor and then being able to go out, that's valuable practice for everyone. And, it, and I think it succeeds in giving people the ability to say, yeah, I can do this. Can, I'd just like to build on that. Dorothy, I agree so much. Uh, I had a funny thing happen when I used to, you know, I wrote for years a column for Flight Training Magazine. Some of you have seen it. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with longer flights we made. And one day, uh, one of the editors, it might have been Ian Twombly, said, you know, Greg, uh, I love reading those stories because nobody does that anymore. Nobody takes an airplane and goes across the country or, you know, to the next state. Of course, it's not nobody. But um, one thing that I have, so I learned in the same era as Dorothy in that 300 mile cross country. And we had 20 hours of solo back then instead of 10. So you were way ahead. Now, we never took a night dual cross country, so there were trade-offs. But here's something that I have found really important and valuable and a moneymaker. Some of your students are on a very tight budget and you really can't do a lot of extra stuff without putting them in, in a difficult situation, right? But other students have the resources. So, Offer students optional lessons that you think they'll get a lot out of and let them decide if they want to invest in them or not. Make sure it's clear. And you might even make a, a, a sign or a list and say, these are some lessons we could do. But the cross country is a great one. You know, this is what the this is what's required. But if your budget allows it. Why don't you do a longer one? That is where you'd really like to go. Um, I remember when I saw you at Palm Springs and you gave that seminar on that. I think you called it fantasy flight training, you know, where you can augment it with more and more and more. But, you know, in the current environment, when I test a CFI, most CFIs have 10 hours of solo, 10.1 hours of solo. And then it's all performing the duties of pilot and command. And you just want to say, geez, do you like to fly? You know, have you had fun in an airplane? No, they haven't. They struggle so hard and they work so hard. And, you know, they're 
out of money, out of patience, out of everything when they get to that CFI check ride. It's, you know, and you just know they're broke. They're not going to build hours. They're going to just go to their Airbus and that's that, you know. Um, I just can't, you know, when all of these airline CFIs in the right seat retire and they want to be a CFI, <laughs> their students <laughs> have, have more money. <laughs> time than they do. I've, I've run into some students who have had those people as instructors and it's been a bad scene because they don't understand the fun of it. I mean, how many of you been into this airport behind me? Do you know? Yeah, that I keep place? seeing that Telluride there. Yep, Telluride. I mean, these are the this is why most of us became pilots. We thought we'd get to do these cool things. And those of you who are in an academy environment, and that I think, Dave, is what you're talking about to a degree, right? Yes, sir. Get checked out in a plane at the local airport and take your friends and go have fun. You're going to learn a ton. You're going to be a better CFI. You're going to do better on the check ride. Uh, but the big part of it is this is what's fly what flying is about, is these adventures. And you can do it. You might not be able to afford to do it every day. But those of you who don't get out of the academy environment and go fly, you're missing out. on. That's very true. You know, we used to do, so I had a, I had more cross country time than I went for a long time, a lot of cross country time. And the way I got it was like this. I would ask my private student, do you think you want to go on and do an instrument rating? You just ask them. And if they said yes, then I would say, how would you like to do it in about two and a half weeks uh, and get all the cross country time, all that, all in about two and a half weeks. And they said, yeah. So I put them in the sim, got them all trained. And we flew from San Jose, California, all the way to Key West, Florida. And we stopped at various places that did instrument approaches, experience on the way, experience on the way back. And then they spent about three or four days prepping for the test. And I would come back with 50 hours cross country time, a numerous amount of experience. And they would also get the same thing. And that was the fun part of flying. That was real practical, real world stuff. And you know, you can do that to this day. You know, you can make, you don't have to be that accelerated, but I would say, can you take 10 days off? If you can, we can do this on the cross country side. They get all 50 hours out of the way. I get 50 hours too, by the way. And I get to charge them a little bit and we get to go to cool places. We go to New Orleans, we'd stop in <clears throat> San Antonio, uh, Bullhead City, Arizona. And we would, I would, it could tell you the route in my head. That's how familiar it was. So, and then we would go to Cabo San Lucas. We'd go there twice. For German students, we go 25 hours each way building experience. And they really liked it. And so I, there, there's a lot to be said about that. But see, that's the, you know, if you get that savvy flight instructor book from Greg Brown, you know, it's <laughs> being, it, no, it's being creative yeah. with your flight instruction. Those people are getting better instruction. They're learning more, you know, and it's a little more money, but the, the, the value there is huge. It's been, you know, if you've never been out of the state of Florida, you know, and you've got a CFI, how how effective are you going to be as an educator? That's crazy. Yes. What do you think, Dorothy? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm all for it. I think the difficulty is uh, if you're at a 141 uh, academy, uh, we have one. Uh, we used to have one nearby, and they would not allow their students to take the airplane out and just rent it. Whereas like Greg said, okay, if that's the case, go to another airport nearby, get checked out so that you can develop those skills uh, as a CFI. Those are the, those are the stories that become the scenarios. I'm not, they're not always going to be necessarily perfect flights, but that's something that you can build on. Uh, and then you can relay that. And I think psychologically, when you're telling a scenario, telling a student how something could go wrong or something could, you know, how, how it affected you during a flight. If it's much more realistic, if it comes from you than from, uh, you know, a story in a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all very practical. I was looking through the chat. So a lot of agreement in the chat. By the way, those of you who want to be beta testers in the chat, I won't have your email address. So you're going to have to, I won't be able to contact you. So you're going to have to uh, send me an email to Mike at CFI bootcamp.com. Mike at CFI bootcamp. I saw a few of you said they wanted to do it. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll put it and I'll put it in the chat now. So you have it, but anyway, uh, yeah, that's all building experience. I guess the theme sort of, we had the theme today, uh, which we still have time uh, today, but it's kind of like the difference between experience, how that matters and what, how it lends itself to, to giving you as a, as a pilot or a new pilot, a really good education, a good experience and, and in a really effective way. 
right? Uh, in an incredibly effective way. And, and like we, I start off with saying, you know, I learned so much with all this. The thing we don't have that medical schools have, medical schools have, you know, residency. So yes, you're a doctor when you're finished with medical school, but they don't let you practice right away because they're like, wait a minute, <laughs> we we take a look here a little bit a little bit harder, right? And and then you work under the guise of people. We don't have that. We have our first five to ten students is our is our is our residency with no oversight half the time, you know. And that that can be tricky because I mean, God help them, those poor the people who want to pay twenty five dollars an hour, right? I mean, I, I I don't know what you're, but so you got to start somewhere. So that's why this idea of mentoring is also a is a really important thing. And we don't we don't have a mechanism which to pin it to. Basically, if you take a brand new CFI, they, they weren't a CFI yesterday. And as soon as they have a green card, there's someone different. Uh, that, they're not. They're the same person they were yesterday. They have the same amount of experience that they had yesterday. They just have, happen to now be able to go practice their craft. So, But it's difficult to get anybody in that in that region say, now what I think you should do is team up with a mentor, take some extra education steps, do this, do that. They won't because they already have what they need to get what the next thing is. Can, and can I, I add to that, part, Mike? Right. Huh? Uh, uh, just a suggestion yeah. on that yeah. for you CFIs and especially flight school owners. One way to accomplish that is to have a dedicated weekly meeting that's not about the business of the operation, but you talk about the different students as a group. And that way, if you're having a rough time, say, teaching someone landings or there's a motivational problem or personality problem, you put your heads together and talk about it. And of course, ideally, you have some experienced people there. It's just a way you can create mentorship as, simp as simply as having a weekly meeting to talk about each student's progress and then have everyone pitch in and share. It's And it's fun. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fun. I think that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Damn, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I guess I don't get to write the third edition. <laughs> <laughs> you can certainly write a chapter in it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, let's go through the chat here. Let me just make sure. Everybody... I, I'll just, before yeah, you... go ahead. You do that while I go through the chat. One other thing, Mike, and, and this has to do with the amount of time we spend. I, you know, I always had a lesson. It was usually two and a half, maybe three hours. With my clients, of course, we charged for the whole amount of time, maybe a little bit here or there was taken off or, you know, something, but, but that amount of time, not the hour in the air, we had time to brief, ground briefing, we had our maybe hour and a half in the air, maybe not, maybe longer, whatever it was for the lesson, and then we had debriefing time, and usually, unless it was cross country, this took, you know, a good three hours, no one was stressed, so one of the things I would ask my clients before they started with me was, this is going to take some time. What in your busy schedule, because many of them were business owners or, you know, people who had uh, enough, uh, who wanted to learn to fly, not necessarily for a career, but for uh, other reasons. What in your life, your tennis, your golf, what are you going to take away for the next so many months so that you can dedicate some time to this endeavor? Because they're busy people, but they didn't get that they had to put in this time to get to the airport, time to have the lesson. Once we could propose that, then they had a better understanding of what it would take to become a pilot. Yes. Yeah, that's, you know, it's the, I, I have three hour blocks like you saying, I, I find this two hours doesn't work. You know, by the time we do a pre-flight briefing, we do a little bit of pre-flight, we get the airplane for a half hour, 45 minutes, we had to come back and rush and it doesn't work very well. And it's not, you know, it's not very good for the student because students got to pay for the taxi time out anyway, no matter what, right? So, so if it if that takes two times longer, you know, because we're lessons are too short, that's more money. So yeah, I, I I'm with you on that on that. How about anybody else before we open up the room here a little bit to let anybody? Um, I wanted to just talk uh, briefly about crosswind stuff, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So uh, one thing that I think I'm going to post an article in the chat here that you guys can read. And um, it says tailwheel. It's not just about the rudder dummy. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it's a pretty it's a pretty funny article. But um, it, this uh, is specifically about tailwheel instructing, but uh, it applies to trike just as much. But uh, something that you can do to teach uh, to teach crosswinds, and I've seen this in the King's video as well, um, is where you just come down and you uh, you know fall center line. And you have that longitudinal alignment. I'll, I call that point. Point with the pedals, and then you drift with the ailerons. 
So this is across the runway, and then this is pointing down at the end of the runway. And um, so something that I do, uh, you know, and I don't know that, you know, I would suggest this to anybody else or, or not, uh, you know, at your own discretion. But um, something that I do is I feel like that part of the landing test that's so hard to uh, convey to students is there's probably, I don't know, I, I think I counted up in nine separate tests that you have to all master and it all has to come together and it has also has to have the right timing. That's why we need like, you know, 60 to 100 landings to get the student to get their first landing, right? So um, anyway, so as we're doing um, these landings, um, then uh, what I do is just separate the separate it out. So I, I keep the throttle and I'll keep the stick at first and then I'll just have them I'll demo, you know, this is the nose is left, the nose is right, and show them the site picture. Okay, now you tell me where the nose is straight or where the if the nose is left or right. And then um, then I'll have them do it while I'm controlling the stick and the power um, and things like that. So I divide out the, the separate tasks and then just let them focus on one task at a time to be able to master it. It's called block practice. That's right. There we go. There you go. Yeah. Well, I I call it sunrise, slow flight. And I do that with, excuse me, every student I'm going to teach to land, we do that first. And then every one of those is a go around. Every one of those is a go around. And so they're really good at go arounds. And then you're just doing it and you reduce a little power and it touches down and there's your landing. And it really gets them over the fear of the runway too. Yeah. So I think that's very effective, Rex. You did a lot of this work uh, with, the, you have an article or some articles on safes about the crosswind landings being an issue, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, crosswinds. I had a flight instructor applicant cancel a flight test because of a seven knot crosswind the other day. What? <laughs> <laughs> and you know how desperate they are for for getting flight tests. Yeah. Seven knots. I said, like, you got to be kidding me. That's interesting. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Right? Vicious, right. vicious. <laughs> Terrible, was gusting three knots of gut on it too right Jeez. <laughs> you know said, we thing, are really going down the toilet now <laughs> one thing that i have found useful to address the fear part of this if it's fear we hope it's we hope it's they're nervous right mike rather than they're yeah. not competent to do it which is a different yeah. issue but uh for, for pilots in general, but especially those in training, I like to make a, a big deal out of the difference between facts and gut feeling. That when you're getting, all of us get nervous sometimes before a flight, right? It, it, whether it's a check ride or something like that where we're being tested, what could be a weather concern, it could be a mechanical, you know, the plane just came out of annual and we're gonna fly over rugged terrain. But you, when you're getting ready to go, especially on the ground, you want to say to yourself, do the facts say it is safe to go? And if the facts say it's safe to go, you go. Otherwise, you stay on the ground all the time and you never go anywhere. Gut mm -hmm. feeling, a lot of people, well, I just didn't feel right about it, so I didn't go. You'll never go anywhere. So mm -hmm. you have to learn to squelch those butterflies and go with the facts. I've had the training. The plane's running great. There's no reason why logically I can't complete this mission. I'm going. Mm -hmm. And I think that you that starts at the student level. And it's something you can actually help them with on the dual lessons. If you sense they're nervous, have a little discussion about it. And go over the facts with them. Help them rationalize it. Hey, it's okay today. And and then they that will go on with them after they're licensed. Overcoming overcoming fear is a lot of, you know, what it requires to become a pilot. And that happens incrementally, too. So mm. you know, I, I also mentioned, you know, we have an article on lockup, which is not really talked about. But if you scare a student, if they get really scared and they grab those controls, I mean, that happens more than you think. RCFIs reported 65% of them said they had had a student lock up on the controls where they wow. had to forcibly take the controls over 65%. So, you know, do never, never scare a student, you know, right. make sure they're in their comfort zone. Yeah, that's the effective domain <laughs> from the FOI. Get them out of that as soon <laughs> as possible.
Yeah, that's interesting. So I think it's a pretty productive discussion. We're nearing the end of the time, but we're going to keep the room open. So whoever can stay, it's fine. And we'll let you ask questions. I mean, we kind of do that. If we have a live CFI meeting, we can't do that, but we can do it this time. But before I do that, because we stop everything, we close out the show, then we'll uh, then we'll have people, we'll unmute everybody. So you have something good to say, bad to say, whatever you want to say, it's always okay. What I say, right? We, I learned from your comments. You ask a lot of really good questions sometimes, especially Wendell. Wendell's going to laugh is going to laugh at us. He, he loves laughing. He's the happiest guy I know. <laughs> he was really fun to have in class too, by the way, just so you know. And happy you're going to be a beta tester. Uh, so any closing comments? We've got about two minutes. Nothing so far. Well, I mean, you all, I thought it was very productive. And I think the essence of it was, was that, you know, getting the, ex it's the experience shining through, right? It's like, is like, how do I let the student learn? What, what's the best way to, to let the student learn? And it is by letting them fly, letting them have the controls and transitioning the pilot command uh, abilities to them, you know, as, as they're able to, to do it and not jumping on the controls and not making sure that we create enough experiences for them to be able to get, to get out of flying what it's supposed to be and not create these people walking through a world with 10 hours of solo who are afraid of their own selves. So that's really bad. So we don't want that. So get really good quality instruction. And anybody here could do it. You know, any, any, there's plenty of place on SAFE's uh, website. You can find plenty of people who can, do, who, can, who can do that, but get experience. And if you if you want to go cheap, I mean, you could, or maybe your friend is here, whatever, but get someone looking out for you on top of that, right? Yeah, there you go. Make sure someone, a really experienced person is, is guiding you or helping you every so often to say, let me do a stage evaluation check or something for someone. We find that to work out okay. All right. Well, I will thank everybody for showing up. It's one o'clock now. I need to close it out. But uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, open, we'll close it out just for now, and I will open back up the room here in a second and let every uh, let people ask their their questions. So thanks very much for all of your comments. They were all like perfect. So let's. Thanks say for having us, Mike. That. So we'll go here in a little bit. Welcome to my room. Thank you. I'm Miami. That's another